be in Galatians chapter 2 this evening. Galatians chapter 2. Paul is writing to the Gentiles to deal with a uh, group of false teachers that come in, what we call the Judaizers. Uh, they were groups of people that uh, came in, we assume to be Jews in every case, uh, that came in teaching that the works of the law or following the law was needed for salvation. That basically everybody had to become a Jew before they could become a Christian. Uh, they uh, came in and most often their biggest uh, focus was circumcision, but it was the law as a whole. They needed to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved, and it's something that was very common in the uh, early churches, uh, and basically what it was was a works for salvation uh, message that they would preach. And Paul's writing to the Galatians, and the reason is because of these Judaizers that had come in, and we saw in chapter 1 that he, he basically says, why have you guys left the, the gospel that you guys have believed in? Why have you guys abandoned this so quickly? Because this isn't what you believe in. This isn't what I taught you. And you just so quickly just left it and went off after something else. And he, he calls them out on that and then begins talking about where the gospel came from that he preached to them, which was the gospel of salvation by grace and grace alone. Uh, salvation was through Jesus Christ and that's it. Uh, and he tells them in, in the latter half of chapter 1 that the message that he brought to them, the gospel that he preached to them, is not one that was established by people. It's not one that came by the authority of people. It's one that came from Christ and Christ alone. <clears throat> that Paul himself, all of his learning, and he, he talks a, a, about a, a period uh, in between when he was saved and when he... Uh, returns to Damascus and leaves, and he, he talks about that period as being a time that uh, Christ teaches him. And Christ teaches them the gospel and, and, and educates him on things, and that everything he knows, everything he taught, came from that period. That it wasn't based on what other people uh, taught him. And one of the things that the Judaizers would often do, and <coughs> In Acts chapter 15, we see our kind of our first introduction to them, and Paul actually references the events that take place in Acts chapter 15. What they would do is they'd come in, and they would claim that they were coming from the apostles in Jerusalem, that they were sent by the apostles, and that that was their uh, credentials, to say, for why they needed to believe everything they taught. Uh, and Paul basically tells them, my credentials are the credentials of Christ. The credentials of what is the truth is what came from Christ, Christ alone. And now he's going to directly address the credentials that the false teachers, the Judaizers, would try to use, which was that they came from the apostles. Because what we're going to see here in the beginning of this chapter, in the first ten verses, Paul references when he first came across the, the Judaizers when the problem came and he had to go back to Jerusalem and talk to the apostles. And he, he's going to account of the, the events that took place there and showing that the apostles are actually in agreement with him. And the apostles are, are with him and, and he, he's also, and we won't get to it today, but he also is going to talk about a time when Peter himself fell into the trap of seeing Jews as being worth more and Paul himself having called them out on it uh, and made it apparent in other Jews as well that were with Peter. And so what he's doing here is he said he's, he's taking the credentials of the Judaizers and saying the people that they say that they came from, the people that they say taught them what they're teaching you, they don't even agree with them either. And so not only is the gospel that I gave you from Christ, but the gospel or the, the message that these people are telling you didn't even come from the apostles. It came from themselves. Uh, it, it definitely didn't come from anybody uh, following 
floor. So, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, I'm just so humbled in your presence, the blessing we have to come to approach your throne, to seek you, and the blessing that you give us of this opportunity to study your word, Lord. I pray that you would just open our hearts to it, help us to be attentive to your word. Pray that you would uh, guide and direct me. That you forgive me for my shortcomings. That everything would um, be usable by you. That it would bring ultimately glory to you and honor to you. That it would all be for you. And you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. As we start here in chapter 2, he says, in verse 1 he says, Therefore, fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. So in the previous chapter he talks about his first time that he goes to Jerusalem. And that being, uh, well, let's go ahead and go into chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Uh, and then verse 21 says, And afterward I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by the face of the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Uh, and so he, he's referencing here his, his time of ministry. And he goes into chapter 2 and he says, And 14 laters after my ministry as Paul began, uh, he, he says, I went back to Jerusalem. And this is after his first missionary journey, man. Uh, <clears throat> this takes place after his first missionary journey. He goes back to the church of Antioch, which is the church that he was sent out from to begin ministering to the Gentiles and, and reaching other churches with the gospel of Christ. And he returns to them, and at this time is when the Judaizers come in and he says, as he continues, he says here that after 14 years he went again to Jerusalem. And he took Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And in verse 2 he says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. I want us to go ahead and go back to Acts chapter 15. And look at these events that he's talking about here. When he returns back to, or he goes to Jerusalem to uh, be at, at the Jerusalem church and, and to work with the other apostles on this topic. And in Acts chapter 15, in verse 1, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So we have here the main doctrine of the Judaizers, the, the need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And they were telling them that they came from Judea, that they were coming by uh, surely the uh, authority of the apostles as well. And they come and they teach us, and then in verse 2 it says, And when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And so it tells us that they, of course, Paul and Barnabas argue very, with great conviction against these men. Because, you know, remember, this is after Paul and Barnabas had traveled and, and gone on their first missionary journey and seen many churches in the Gentile world established and blessed by the Lord. Uh, they, they'd seen the work, they'd seen the Holy Spirit coming upon these churches, they'd seen people being saved, the, the fruits of it. Uh, and as well, Paul, having been taught by Christ before all of that, knew the truth. So he knew that when they came, that the things they were teaching it, it was garbage. 
So he, uh, of course, argues with them, but we see here that it's decided, though, to go ahead and go to Jerusalem and, and speak to the apostles. Get to the beginning of it, and, and let's figure out what is actually taking place here. If you go down to verse 4, it says, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church, and of the apostles and elders, and he declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you see that once they arrive in Jerusalem, Paul and, and Barnabas, they stand up and they declare everything that had taken place that they had observed so far. They told them of all these times where God had worked, all these people that had been saved, all the, the fruits of it. And they, they talk about all this, and of course there's those that were Pharisees, right? Christian, these were Christians that had been converted, but were raised Pharisees. And they stand up and they say, oh no, we need to be telling these people that they need to be circumcised. We need to be telling them that this is is something that needs to be taking place. And we see it in verse 6. It says, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. We see here, Peter is referencing his uh, experience with uh, Cornelius and also the vision that God gives to him. And, and telling him that the things that God is, uh, the vision is basically God telling him that, what God is defined as being clean, do not say is unclean. And this is teaching him that the gospel is opened up for the Gentiles. That it's not just for the Jews. That it's not just for those that have uh, followed the law of Moses or been raised up in it. It's for everybody. And Peter tells him, he says, you guys remember that whenever I went and God chose me and he told me to go unto the Gentiles and share the gospel with them. And if you look back in the account, we see also that others end up coming afterwards and they experience and see that the Holy Ghost comes upon the people there. That a church is established and blessed by God there. Peter says, you guys remember that I had this happen to me. I've seen this happen too. This isn't just Paul that is talking about these things. I've seen it as well. And these people, these Gentiles... He, he said, I love it here because in verse 8 he says, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness. He said, God saw into their hearts. God made the decision here, and God said, These people are saved, and I'm going to work through them. And he tells them, There's no difference between them and us because they were purified by their faith. They were purified by their faith, not carrying out. The circumcision, not carrying out the law of Moses. They are saved by one thing and one thing alone, their faith. And then notice in verse 10, he says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which are neither which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And Peter makes a very valid point here as well. He says, you know, these disciples, they've been set free from their sins. They've been set free from the life of paganism, wherever they came from. And us, by trying to impose on them the law of Moses, is just placing them, is just basically putting them back in slavery. Putting them back into their bondage. We're putting an unnecessary burden upon them by requiring that they do these things in order to be a Christian. Because, and he says here, we're going to ask them to do it, but we and our fathers couldn't even bear this yoke. 
and Gentiles that were never raised in any of this. They don't know anything about it. We're going to ask them to do something that we can't even do. That we can't even accomplish. It doesn't make any sense. So he finishes in verse 11 and says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. So the Judaizers, they were coming in and they were saying, So in order to be saved, you have to be as us. You have to do the things that we do. You have to follow the things that we follow. And Peter stands up and says, No. We're saved the same way they are saved. I like it here that he flips it. Instead of saying they become as we are, he says, we are the same as them. The process for us was the same as them. Showing the equality here. And the uh, it's sealed. Make decisions. So let's go ahead and go back to Galatians. We're going to see more about what Paul talks about these events taking place. And we, we saw in verse 2, it, it's talking about having gone up. What's the notice here? He says, And I went up by revelation. Uh, you know, he tells us here that he went up by revelation that God himself uh, sent him there. Uh, you know, this may even indicate for us that, the, uh, well, it, it does indicate for us that the reason Paul went wasn't because the church told him to or because he was having to argue with these uh, Judaizers. It was simply because the Lord told him to go and account of the things that's taking place here. Uh, I'm sure that from this there were those in Jerusalem that were taught some things from this. Uh, especially since you see the back and forth arguing here. Uh, and, you know, it, it may even be that Paul, without the Lord's revelation, it never would have went just simply because he would have seen it as being something that's sure and firm. There's no reason to go and argue with it. Uh, just looking at Paul's personality and, and attitude with things in the gospel, uh, he has no desire to have to deal with stuff that is of no uh, value. He, he just as well throw it out. You know, he, when he talks to the Corinthians, one of the things that he talks about is that he, he's having to talk about things that he shouldn't have ever, shouldn't be still having to teach them. They, they, they haven't grown, and so he still had to do this. And then, as they correct them, he's just like, I've got to talk to you guys about who I am as an apostle, the things I've accomplished, because you guys are not doing what's right. He's like, hey, you're making me to be a fool because you're not doing and listening to what's right. Uh, and so very likely Paul would have stayed there, but the Lord leads him in and takes him there. And he, he talks about having, uh, he, he says, and, and that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So he went and he communicated to them, he told them as we saw the gospel that had taken place in the Gentiles. And we see here as well that he gives us a, a, a little bit of, information about this. You know, when we look at Acts, it seems to be something that's very much so private in an open forum. But here in verse 2, he says, But I privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or have run in vain. He also, he does a, a public setting as we see in Acts chapter 15, but here he indicates as well a more private setting that he does this. And he talks about it amongst the apostles and other elders of the church, others that were leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And he talks about it here, and the reason for it is to make sure that the work that he had done or should, continue, or should do in the future would still have value, would still be fruitful. And I want us to realize something here. Paul is not talking about himself having doubted the truth. Paul's not talking about doubting this. Paul knew the truth. He'd been taught by Jesus the truth. What he's referring to here is he wants to make sure and establish 
was the truth for everyone to make sure that there aren't others that come out of Jerusalem and cause other problems for those that he worked in, for those that had accepted the gospel, and for those that he knows he's going to share the gospel with later on. What he's wanting to do is try and prevent as much of this heresy as possible. Not that the apostles were spreading it, but to just further establish it for others that were there. Paul, what he's doing, he's telling the Gentiles, this is something that was very important to me. I was so sure of this that I wanted to make sure that other people realized it as well. I was so confident in what Christ had given to me that I wanted to make sure that others were taught this as well so that they wouldn't go and cause problems for others that accepted Christ, just as you would. And notice here in verse 3, he talks about what he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. You know, Titus is a, a, a Greek, a Gentile that was uncircumcised. And he, he tells him, you know, Titus went with me. He was here for all of this, all the arguments, all the debates, back and forth in the conclusion. And from it all, he had no desire, no felt no need to be circumcised. You know, this speaks to the strength in the uh, of the, the truth here. Because, you know, there are, are times, and, and Paul's talked about it as well, to, and we actually see in Acts that at one point he has Timothy circumcised to better be able to share the gospel. But for Titus here to not walk away feeling even a little bit of a need to do this shows how unified people were in the end when Paul left. That there was no need for it. And so if Titus could go, could listen to all the arguing, all the uh, answers back and forth, and walk away knowing that there's no need for him, then you can also. Then you can know also that it's not needed for salvation. It's not needed to follow Christ. You know, many of the, the Judaizers, they, they claim that the apostles were in favor of the things that they were teaching. And what Paul shows here is he's saying, hey, the apostles aren't in agreement with these things. The apostles are in agreement with me. The apostles are in agreement with the gospel that I gave you that you've rejected. You need to go back to that. You can trust in this. Because it's not just me, it's them as well. Verse 4, it says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we give place by subjection, know not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul talks about these Judaizers coming in and sneaking in unawares and, and causing problems for it. He says, and, and knowing that these people were going to come, this is why I put in this work for This is why we did this. And these people, they're... There's no there shouldn't be any opportunity for them to continue. Because their, their desire, what they're going to do, is they're, they're going to sneak in. And it says, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. It says, what they're doing when they come, as they take the liberty that we have, they take the truth that we have, they take the gospel that you have, and they take it and they twist it into bondage. They corrupt it. And he's not talking about here of them losing their salvation. What he's talking about here is them being placed, as Peter talked about back in Acts chapter 15, of being placed under, under a yoke, of having a burden that is unbearable, that cannot be borne. You know, the, and this is what's 
teachings of works for salvation. You know, one of the things I don't, I'm sure it's, obviously it's always existed, but you know, there are many people that they'll try and, and work it in. And try and say that it's needed, but when we say that works are needed to have salvation or to keep salvation, we're placing a burden, we're putting a yoke that cannot be held up. It cannot be borne. It is impossible for our works to gain salvation or to keep our salvation. It's impossible. There are many that they'll talk about salvation being by grace, but then they'll talk about keeping your salvation being by works. If our works weren't good enough to get salvation, they're not going to be good enough to keep salvation. It just can't work that way. Each and every single one of us, we are, even after salvation, even though we are a new creature, even though we've been made new in Christ, we have a new spirit, we still have a fleshly body that cannot obtain perfection, that cannot live according to the standard that God has set for perfection. It cannot. Now, we are still supposed to attempt to follow the Lord, to follow His commands. Well, Paul, after chapter 5 in Romans, speaking about our uh, the grace being much more abound, that grace is more than enough. He, he had the question is posed in chapter 6 of whether or not we should just keep doing sin in order for grace to abound. Or because grace is overwhelming and Paul says, no, you shouldn't. He says, God forbid. There's still supposed to be the change there. But in the context of our salvation... It has no effect. Because it's a yoke that we cannot bear. If works was required to keep salvation, each and every single one of us would be lost the moment that we were saved. That's what happened. Because all sin is equal in God's eyes. There are certain sin that we see as being bigger more important, you know, the Judaizers, they like to come in and they like to put a lot of focus on the circumcision. You know, they talk about the works of Moses or the law of Moses, but really what they focused in and dialed in on was the circumcision. But there was so much more to it. Yes, the circumcision in the Old Testament had a very important meaning and was taken very seriously by God on many occasions. But all the other sins were taken just as serious. All the other commands by God were taken just as serious. So he says, these people, they come in, they take our liberty, and when they try to teach us, they place us back into a bondage. He says, and we, we give no opportunity for that. We're not going to let that go at all because we don't want you guys to. We don't, we're, we don't want you guys to fall into this. We're not going to even consider it for a second. And what he's telling her as well is you need to throw that out. You need to leave it to get rid of it. It has of no value for you. If you do that, he says that the truth of the gospel might continue in you. And this is a thing, this is his purpose in all of that. It's not about establishing Paul as being right. Paul didn't care about being right. He didn't care at all. Anytime he's ever had to talk about himself, he hates it. What he's concerned here is with the gospel of Christ continuing in them. That they continue teaching the truth that they're secure in their salvation. You know, if my works, if my salvation was dependent on my works, me keeping it was dependent on my works, There's no security for them. There's no guarantee. Every single day will be a day 
be able to, when asked the question, if you died today, where would you go? You wouldn't be able to answer it with, well, I'm going to heaven. You have to say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. I think I might go to heaven. It might happen. Hope I've done enough for it to happen. No. We can say, I've got the gospel of Christ. I've been saved by Christ. I'm saved. And when I die, I am going to spend eternity in heaven with my Lord and Savior. We can be confident. And Paul here, he wants the, Gen the Galatians to be able to be confident in what they have. He wants them to be uh, secure in it, to not be doubting these things because that's what's going to happen. It's what's happening. Verse 6, it says, But of these, who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, and maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul here, he's referring back to the private conference he had with the leaders of Jerusalem. And he, he's kind of wrapping up this time, and he, he said, They agreed with me in the context of the gospel. The Excuse me, and, and place no importance on the law of Moses for salvation. That in context of salvation, all you need is Christ. And he says here that these people in the end, they added nothing else. They had no corrections to the gospel that I was preaching, to the message that I was giving people. They had nothing. And this shows, again, that the apostles and Paul are in agreement here, are on the same page. That the message that those in Jerusalem have, the Jews have, and the message that Paul has preached to the Gentiles is exactly the same. Nothing for them to worry about. I like it here that Paul gives us a little bit of a uh, rabbit here. And he, he tells us that those that, who seemed to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepted no man's person. You know, this is not a, Paul did not mean this in a, uh, a, a stab against the apostles or the elders in Jerusalem. Uh, basically, the way he's saying here, and, they were the leaders, but ultimately God sees everybody as being equal. Uh, this is what he's talking about. He's saying these, these men, even though they were the leaders, they're still just the same person. Just have a different job. Uh, and I like this because Paul's talking about them and being this way, but when you look at his other writings, he talks about himself in this way as well. That he's nothing. He talks about himself as being blessed because God thought him worthy to share the gospel. That God decided he could do something. And he sees himself, he sees everybody on the same field. And all that matters is just whatever God is doing. And this is something important to remember. This is important to remember because we like to place priority in people. See people at different levels as being greater. Sometimes even we'll see ourselves as being better, or more important. Yeah, I've, I know of churches, I've met people in churches that thought that whatever they thought was the way it's supposed to go. That they were higher up than everybody else. And that's not true. As well in it. And this is just as concerning to me as there are people that think themselves less in the church. That they don't have a purpose that is just as important. That they are subpar within the church. And I don't mean this in the context of being humble and realizing your place, but in the context of thinking that you don't have anything to add or that you're not valuable because of who you are and what you do. What Paul's talking about here is he's saying everybody's equal. God doesn't care about who the person is. What matters is the work that the Lord is doing. 
And every work that we allow to do through us is the same and just as important as anybody else's. Yes, I, as a pastor and the leader of this church under Christ, have a different uh, purpose in the church. And I'm, I'm held to a, uh, an account, uh, held accountable for that purpose. As an individual, I'm not any different. What's different is what the Lord is doing. And how the Lord is working. And the same is for each and every one of us. Verse 7, he says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, for he had wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And he says, So, another thing that they saw here was that my purpose was to go and to preach to the Gentiles. And that the work that was being done in me was the same work that was, Peter was being used to work to the Jews. What he's saying here is the work that was being done here was all the same. You know, there, uh, and this is the thing as well that the Judaizers were trying to do is they were trying to say that there was a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. They're trying to say that there's something different about them, that the work that's being done in the Gentiles isn't as good, it's not fulfilled, because they're not Jews. So they need to become Jews, so that the work can be the same here. And what Paul's saying, saying, the work well, I was being done, that was being done through me, the work that God was doing in the Gentiles through me was the same work that he was doing through Peter with the Jews. So it's equal. He's telling the Gentiles, or the, the Galatians, he's saying, even though you are Gentiles, God's done the same thing in you as what he's done in them. He's able to do the same thing in you as what he's done in them. It's the same thing. And this is something I want us to remember as well. We look at people in Scripture sometimes. At least I know I do it at times. And we see them. We see the things that are being done there, and I think we allow ourselves to be disconnected from it. That somehow what was taking place there was different than what takes place here. And somehow they were different than we are in the world. And yeah, we're in a different we're in a different society, we're on a different continent, a, a different age. But God that worked in Peter and worked in Paul was the same for them. And the God that works in us and the things of us is exactly the same as well. The work that's being done by God has always been the same. The goal that he has has not ever changed. The power that he has has not ever changed. Now, one of the things I believe wholeheartedly is that we're actually more equipped than Peter and Paul because we have the completed Word of God. I believe we have access to things that are much better than what Paul and Peter had because we have God's Word. But the power of God is exactly the same. Just because he's, we have different missions under God than what Paul had. And this is something as well. Paul was unique in being an apostle in that calling. But in that calling, he was accomplishing the same thing that each of us has been called to do, just in the way that God has called us. Spread the kingdom of God. Teach his word. The only thing that was unique is in how God was using him, not in the power of God and the message that was being preached. Our message today is exactly the same that Paul preached. The way that God saves is exactly the same today as it was when Paul preached. And 
This is something too. We like to try, the temptation is to look at new ideas and new directions and missions to accomplish work of God. And what we need to do is keep with the same message, the same gospel that Paul and Peter preached. The gospel of grace. The gospel of Christ. He talks about here is that being just as mighty in Paul as it is in Peter. Then verse 9 says, And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they should unto the circumcision. He says, And, and, and uh, James, Peter, and John, who, and he, he, perceived, he says they're perceived to be pillars. You know, people think of them as being amazing. He says, they agreed. And in the end, they blessed us in our work. They gave us the right hand of fellowship. They agreed with us. They were one with us. And they said, go and do what God has called you to do. We're not going to change anything about it. You've been called to do this, and we think y'all are doing great. We're all on board with it. So these Judaizers, they came in and they said, Nah, Paul ain't any good. The message he's preaching is not any good. Reject that. And Paul says, No, the apostles, they're all for us. They're in full agreement. They say, The work I did with you guys, the gospel that I gave to you that you've rejected, is the gospel that you need. It's the gospel that you need to keep on. says in verse 10, he says, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. He says the only thing that they added to us, the only thing that they wanted to ask us to do was to remember the poor, those that were in need. Uh, what we see elsewhere that those in Jerusalem uh, were hurting. The church in Jerusalem started hurting financially, was very much so oppressed, and that money is sent to help them uh, later on. And it probably, it says they, they asked that we would remember their need, and Paul says, I was all for it. I was, I was already of the mind to it, I, I was all for doing it. And I love this end to it because they came in, who tried to come up, there was a problem. They talked out, they resolved it, they came to the conclusion they were of one, and they ended it with, keep praying for us. Help us out. And I love the unity that is expressed here. This shows the unity that was there, that they were willing to ask of Paul to remember them. 